public public engagement observatories new dedicated website and open access database and we wanted to also take this opportunity to provide an introduction to the observatory before opening up to a panel discussion on how it relates to the future of public engagement with energy and climate change. My name is Jason Chilvers. I'm a co-director of UKIRK and I lead uh, the Public Engagement Observatory. And in terms of uh, the outline of today's webinar, well, I'm gonna kick things off with an introduction to the observatory and its website. And then I'm gonna invite our panelists today, Becky Willis, Jim Watson, Simon Burrell to offer their perspectives. And then I'm going to hand over to Helen Pallet, who's the deputy lead of the observatory, to provide a brief response. And then we're going to open it up to uh, Q and A. Just to set the scene uh, a little bit at the start here, the work of the observatory is associated with a new direction in how we might address the challenge of public engagement with energy and climate change. The common assumption used to be of a deficit of public understanding that needs to be corrected with improved communications. Uh, this traditional emphasis on communicating to the public perhaps is necessary, but has proven to be limited in, in empowering social transformation. And this has led to then a drive to develop active and more interactive forms of public engagement. For example, to elicit public views in opinion polls or deliberative processes through to prompting citizen action in behavior change uh, or community initiatives. Now, these are really important initiatives in their own right, uh, but these mainstream approaches often emphasize inviting a so-called unengaged public in quite discrete one-off forms of engagement that attend to particular parts of wider systems. And so partly in response to these uh, deficiencies in these first two moves, a, a new third way of seeing and doing public engagement is emerging, which views public engagement as being highly diverse, so it recognizes the many different ways in which citizens are enga already engaging with issues like energy and climate change. And the, the, this new way of thinking this through also sees public engagement as being systemic in that different public engagements don't occur in isolation. They're actually interconnecting and interrelating in wider systems. And we developed this uh, perspective in the previous phase of UKIRK, and we worked on a new systemic approach to mapping diverse forms of public engagement with energy and low carbon conditions. And we uh, are mapping of 258 cases of public participation and engagement with energy and low carbon transitions revealed this sheer diversity of the different ways in which publics are already engaging. This went beyond institution-led processes towards the left-hand side of this diagram to also encompass those that are citizen-led um, and explored how all of these uh, instances of engagement are kind of interrelating and connecting up in a wider system. Now, this kind of mapping was pretty novel in an academic sense at the time. But we were really kind of delighted and, uh, and a little bit surprised to find that practitioners as well found uh, value in it. And it was seen to, in this way, offer more comprehensive insights into public engagement, into diverse citizen views and actions. It was seen to highlight emergent or excluded forms of engagement across wider systems that otherwise might be missed. And also people were finding value in this offering, maybe an opportunity for a more strategic or connected approaches to public engagement, which might assist the design of new forms of engagement. And so this work underpins our UK public engagement observatory approach, which has three aims. The first is to develop and carry out new approaches that map diverse forms of participation and engagement with energy and climate change on an ongoing basis. So our previous mapping was uh, 
of a particular time and of a particular moment. But obviously, public engagement is in flux. It's continually emerging. It's continually ongoing. And so uh, the, the move to an observatory allows us to track this on an ongoing basis. Second aim is to establish an observatory network to make connections and encourage learning across wider systems of public engagement in the UK and also internationally. This um, responds to the identification in some of our early work and, and just the general feeling that uh, a lot of approaches to public engagement are quite fragmented. There are different methods, different communities of practice. And our observatory seeks to, to link some of this together. And then the third aim is to openly share, experiment, and undertake mappings with others to help make energy and climate related decisions, innovations, and participation processes more just, more responsible, and responsive to society. So the observatory is based in our 3S group, our Science, Society, and Sustainability Research Group at UEA. And in the team, well, there's myself and Helen, and also Tom Hargreaves. Felia Stefanides and Laurie Waller is, has been part of our team. He's now at the University of Manchester. Now these three aims then uh, relate to three strands of research and activity in, in the observatory. So the first is to map diverse forms of public engagement with energy and climate change on an ongoing basis. And we are taking forward our comparative case analysis method that we developed in, in the previous phase of UKIRC, and we've updated our previous national mapping through to the current day, analyzing over 300 additional cases of public engagement identified through academic and web searches. But we're bringing uh, another two kind of types of method uh, into the mix here with crowdsourcing where we're involving stakeholders and citizens in mapping public engagement with energy and climate change from their own perspectives through open calls for evidence also moving on to um, forms of citizen social science and we also have digital methods where we're repurposing online devices and platforms such as google and twitter to map actor engagements uh, uh, in uh, debates emerging around energy, climate change, and net zero transition. Our observatory network connects UK and international actors interested in public engagement with energy and climate change, serves as a platform also for learning and exchange. We have a national network, we have international partners, we have a series of events, workshops, publications, and resources and as we'll say in a moment, our website as well to bring this all together. And finally, we are undertaking experiments to explore how novel approaches to mapping public engagement can make a difference or potentially make a difference to energy and climate related decisions, innovations and new forms of participation. So we're doing this through visualizing these mappings in different ways and, and sharing them more openly but also we are doing some more in-depth work um, undertaking what we're calling demonstration experiments with partner organizations. And these include uh, an experiment that we're collaborating with Bayes um, on informing net zero policies and engagement strategies nationally in the UK. We've been working with the Dutch government um, on helping them with the participation mapping in the Netherlands to inform Dutch climate policy. We're working with Anglian Water um, to use some of the mappings of the observatory to inform responsible innovation of new hydrogen technologies. And we're partnering with uh, climate citizens, Becky Willis, who you'll hear from in a moment, and others, and Climate Change Committee in shaping new de democratic innovations in the form of a citizens panel on decarbonizing energy in homes. But a central part of all this that, that kind of helps make it happen is the observatory website and also its interactive online database. And we're delighted to be able to share this with you today. Um, the web address for the website is on the slide here. It's ukirk-observatory.ac.uk. So please visit and have a look around. Um, you'll find that the website includes information about us, about the observatory, 
and the background and, and why it's happening. Um, you'll see across the top of the slide there and of the website, you can, there are different areas around these core functions of mapping, networking, uh, experiments, and also we have uh, a resources section, which we'll be building um, over the, the, the forthcoming uh, months as well. In the website, you can openly explore case studies, these diverse case studies of public engagement with energy and climate change, identified in our mappings going back to 2010. And you can filter those around, diff around forms of engagement, different types of participants, different topics, different locations in the UK. And we also have a visualized uh, area where you can uh, look at across the whole data set um, and you can further explore the mapping data set. Um, but in terms of the frequency of these case studies by form of engagement, type of participant, topic and location again. And just to point out and to clarify, this is an ongoing mapping. Um, this is by definition will, should and never will be complete because engagement is continually emerging. And so we're going to be updating and adding more cases over the coming weeks and months. This definitely isn't a fixed um, thing. And finally, I just wanted to mention that we also have an area where you can contribute, where you can contribute your own cases of public engagement with energy and climate change that are not included in our current uh, data set, or you can provide further information about those cases that are already there. So yeah, please uh, have a look at the website and um, let us know uh, what you think. Just to say that further information about the rationale, the aims, the work of the observatory is also available in this briefing that we're bringing out to accompany the launch of the website. And if you go on the website, it can be found in the about section. So you can link to the briefing there and we'll also be circulating this briefing more widely in the coming days. So that's all I really wanted to say by way of introduction to the observatory and our new website and online database. So now what I'd like to do is to invite our panelists, our three panelists that we have today to offer their perspectives on the public engagement observatory in the context of future challenges for public engagement with energy and climate change. And so I'm just gonna take a uh, my slides down here while I introduce our first speaker, Becky Willis. Becky is Professor of Energy and Climate Governance at the University of Lancaster, and she currently runs the Climate Citizens Project that I briefly mentioned a moment ago. This examines the role of public engagement with energy and climate governance, and as I mentioned, is a project partner with us in Newkirk. And so over to you, Becky. Thank you very much, Jason. I'm really, really happy to be able to be here for the formal launch. I, I feel like um, we've had so many conversations over the past few months, years even, in terms of developing the idea and working out how our work interacts. So it's 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 uh, great to mark the occasion. Um, I'm really sorry that I have to jump on my bike about uh, quarter to three to get to a medical appointment that I couldn't change, um, but hopefully can get stuck into the discussion before then. Um, so what, what, what do I love about the observatory? I think I can, I can uh, illustrate that by saying what phrase absolutely makes my hackles rise in the public engagement space around energy and climate. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a mild mannered person, but this one gets my back up. And it's when people say we need to bring people with us. And it's a phrase that's used so often by the climate policy community and by uh, politicians um, and by you know, everyone who, for the best possible reasons, wants to see progress on, 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 on climate and on energy decarbonisation. But it's, it's just such a terrible phrase for two reasons. One, it's very linear. And the second is that it posits the public as the problem. Um, it, it, there's this idea that the public, the public singular needs to be sort of brought along this line from not being engaged through to being engaged, therefore um, actively, positively contributing to what needs to be done. 
And what the observatory and previous mapping work has done so brilliantly is just shown the fallacy of this uh, alleged need to bring the public with us. Um, it, it, it's wrong for, because, I mean, the evidence shows the opposite, doesn't it? The first thing is, if you look at the uh, public opinion data around energy and climate, you actually see that it's much more a case of bringing government with us rather than bringing the people with us, because people have, uh, you know, really high levels of concern about climate change, and they look to government to, um, to, to, to act on it. So they're actually looking to government for leadership. Um, but the, the, the second point, and I think a really important sort of uh, philosophical, but also practical point that you and others have, have really brought home for me, Jason, is that um, people already are engaged. They're engaged in ways that are really helpful to the um, transition to net zero. They're engaged in some ways that are frankly unhelpful, that publics are diverse, um, even amongst ourselves, we perform different roles at different times. Um, you know, we're so much more than just consumers, aren't we? Um, we act as citizens, as members of families, as people who have conversations on football touchlines, all kinds of ways in which we might interact with energy and climate. Um, and the observatory and the mapping provides uh, brilliant evidence for all that messy and complex engagement and uses that as a starting point for saying, OK, this is what we know. And how can we make that knowledge useful and how can we find different ways of engaging people without making that assumption of the, the sort of empty vessel assumption, uh, the assumption that they need to be brought with us. So, you know, one early insight I, I've uh, taken from this work is that, you know, there are th there's so many different forms of engagement. Of course, there's formal engagement like Climate Assembly UK that, that I was um, really delighted to be a part of. Um, but, you know, a fracking protester is engaging in the energy system. Um, you know, so is someone who goes to seek... Um, advice from citizens advice because they can't pay their energy bill. You know, these are all forms of, of engagement with the energy system. They are all things that provide us, if, if we go and look, for really useful evidence about how to do policy. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased that we've reached the stage now to see the, the observatory in action. And I'm really pleased as well that we get to work with you as one of your experiments. Um, the, the work that, that uh, me and my team at Climate Citizens are doing with the Climate Change Committee, um, and we've just finished the, uh, the panel process on this, we've run a deliberative panel um, actually working with citizens and policy analysts from the CCC to co-design a package for home energy decarbonisation. Um, and, uh, you know, we sort of took the assumption, uh, buoyed up by all that work that there is about what people understand already, we took the assumption that, um, th that people can think very sensibly about policy design, that they can sit down and work with, um, uh, with you know, policy analysts, policy specialists, if you like, to design meaningful policy. And we saw that happen very, you know, very... Um, uh, very much live in a room in Birmingham and on Zoom. But what was really good about working with the observatory team, um, Jason and Fidius, alongside this, this panel, is that it provided us with that reflection that, you know, this wasn't just a sort of one-off panel that, that popped up. It is only one form of very diverse participation around energy and climate. And that people, you know, the citizens that were involved in our panel who were, you know, very carefully selected to be a representative sample of the population and so on, actually came to the panel, of course, with their own um, ideas, with their own experience. We had a heating engineer there. Um, we had a couple of people who really didn't like heat pumps. Um, uh, we, uh, you know, we had some people who had been engaged in the climate agenda for, um, you know, sort of 50 years in, in one case. And, and they, um, seeing the interactions between the panel members and the panellists and uh, the, the policy experts, um, really reminded me what a sort of diverse and also messy uh, business engagement in energy and climate governance is. 
And uh, your work is a constant reminder to me not to try and parcel it off into sort of easily, um, easily manageable little bits of, of uh, discrete deliberation, um, which is why I'm going to end with uh, slightly cheekily, because I'm going to have to shoot out early, answering one of the questions that's already come in, which I thought was really interesting about a fourth dimension to the observatory, uh, Nigel Hargreaves' question, a fourth dimension for the observatory, which actually looks at policy engagement because the stage I would like to get to is where um, engagement you know positive engagement in energy and climate governance and the transition to net zero is something by which we should be measuring all policies a policy is a good policy if it's um, you know efficient and effective of course you can do your cost benefit analysis but also if it contributes to uh, positive public engagement around the net zero transition and I think that that should be a criterion for policy development alongside everything else that happens according to the you know the famous treasury uh, green book appraisal process so I would love to see this much more built into the process of policy making and the evidence that policymakers would use for that would not just be formal processes but it would absolutely be things like your mapping and explaining those all those messy and complex ways in which we interact with energy um, so I'll I'll end it there but really interested to hear what others have to say Thank you so much, Becky, for kicking us off uh, in that way. Um, just on that point, we're, we're working in one of our experiments with Bayes, and also we've been working with the Dutch government to try and address some of these fourth dimension points. But yeah, a much, you know, there's a broader kind of agenda there, definitely, that it would be um, fantastic to explore. And your um, work with the Climate Change Committee as well, Becky, um, on the Climate Citizen Project, it, you know, is, is, is addressing that too. Thanks so much, Becky your contributions today, but also for, as you've mentioned, um, your, your contributions to the observatory's work so far, and linking up in partnership with the experiment, but also for being a member of our advisory group as well, which has given us uh, some brilliant advice um, thus far. So we're gonna move on now to Jim, Jim Watson. Uh, Jim is professor of energy policy and the director of the UCL Institute for Sustainable Resources as a past director of UKIRK and also an academic lead on Climate Assembly UK, Jim has an insight into public engagement, but also he has an insight into the observatory and the role that it might play. So over to you, Jim. Thanks very much, Jason. And uh, yeah, like Becky, very happy to be here. I mean, I've been associated with the, the genesis of the uh, observatory long before you got it funded as part of UCA, as you know, Jason, and it's been really nice to see how that's developed. And this is another stage in that development. So being able to have not just the website, because you know the launch of a website is fine, but actually you, it's a really active website that people can participate in, in itself. And I think uh, will grow, continue to grow to be a really important resource for people. So it's uh, you know really nice to see this milestone being passed and the and the development of this and some of those partnerships you were talking about in your presentation as well, um, which which are really interesting. I guess I you know I'm going to say or reinforce a lot of the points that Becky made, all of which I I agree with very much. Um, first, in terms of the case for this, uh, you know my own take is very similar that um, you know it is really really needed and more so than ever right now I think in the current context with all the changes that we're experiencing it seems by the day um, you know as, as you noted Jason it was something of a surprise I think to all of us early on in the development of the observatory that uh, there was a lot of appetite from decision makers in government in industry and NGOs that actually something was required. People kind of understood that the public mattered somehow, but I don't think they quite understood uh, enough about what to do about that. And I think the discussions we had before the observatory idea was crystallized really helped to bring together this perspective that we needed to do more than, you know, communicate, as you said in your presentation, and more than, as, as Becky says, you know, bring, bring the public uh, along with us. Uh, on the other hand. So I, I felt at the time, you know, although not everybody instantly converted from, to a more progressive understanding of what public engagement was, that there was a real change away for, for many of the important actors, at least, that, um, you know, we could we needed to go beyond just giving people more information and communicating at them, communicating more loudly that, uh, you know, either climate change was a problem or is here, here is what you need to do about it. 
Um, although having said that, and I think that's been noted already in relation to, to heat, you know, there are some areas when, of course, people do need information. I mean, one of the real massive gaps, uh, you know, which is amazingly still being discussed is, you know, the lack of an independent advice and support service for people who want to do something with their home and upgrade it and access finance and access for project management. So that's more than communication, of course, but there is, of course, uh, you know, an important role for that sort of engagement where people do frankly need help um, so that we can reconstruct, ironically, some of the things we did have around in the UK in the 1980s and 1990s. We used to have energy advice centres in, in, in large towns and cities and we don't anymore. So we need things like that to come back. And I think one of the reasons I think it's more important than ever, I mean, Becky's touched on it, you know, in that we've done some of the more what you might call remote parts of decarbonisation, at least in some ways, you know, it's away from people's homes and immediate lives, although, as you've noted, they do engage with this. So we're decarbonising, you know, the power system at a very rapid rate that's continuing. Some of that infrastructure, of course, is close to people's lives and they've engaged with debates about where it should go and how much we should have and so on. But now it's really starting to come home to choices that affect people more in their daily lives, you know, the way they get around, the way they heat their homes, as I've mentioned, and as Becky has talked about. Uh, and, and that's, I think, why, for me, it's more important than ever to co-develop the plans, you know, from government, from industry, from others that we have for decarbonising those sectors. And that often that's granular, you know, so it actually varies by location. And so then you are engaging with that diversity of different publics in different contexts to, you know, I guess a light on strategies that are going to work, not just work technically, but work economically, work in a distributional sense and in a justice sense. And in the, in the midst of a cost of living crisis, to me, if government and others who are wanting in some ways to lead us down this net zero pathway, um, you know, if they don't pay attention to this, the whole thing is going to come off the rails. So that's my kind of really strongest argument why this kind of intelligence you know is important because frankly government isn't doing the job you know i was just rereading bits of the committee on climate changes progress report from last week and they have a, a section on public engagement and one thing they say quite a few times is that uh, the net zero public engagement strategy we were promised from government has not materialized so in other words you know there isn't a systemic view coming out of government about how they're going to engage the public across the whole myriad of different um, topics in the myriad of different ways that the observatory is highlighting. So I think this resource is, is, is really there and it's there for decision makers to use. Just a couple more things on why the approach is exciting. I mean, I, I, I very much agree with Becky that the diversity for me is, is really important. I found it quite challenging initially to say, oh, you've included, you know, fracking protests in your public engagement kind of definition. But actually, it's really important. It all gives intelligence about what different groups are thinking. And I think the real power of the observatory is that you can bring together and distill evidence across those different ways and you know, review it and perhaps distill it in a form that's useful to decision makers, whether a decision maker is in a local authority, whether they're in a, a company, whether they're a community group or whether they're indeed sitting in Whitehall uh, trying to make a decision about what pieces of infrastructure to invest in. I think the only point I'd end with, which is a, not a note of caution as such, but just to put the, the public engagement into context, and it's just from some contacts I've had with politicians, which I know Rebecca has had as well over the time. I work with politicians directly quite often. And sometimes when you raise things like this, climate assemblies and other forms of public engagement, occasionally they can feel a little threatened by it because they, I guess, feel that they're the elected representative of a particular area of the country and they're the ones who have the democratic legitimacy to have the voice of the public in parliament, in committees, in government, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, you know, there's sometimes a bit of a dialogue required with them to say, well, you know, this is not a replacement. It's actually something which can support and reinforce your more general representation and give you give you as a representative more intelligence about what the public think or sections of the public think or how they engage on a particular set of topics. So, I, you know, I think that's that's an important part of the uh, observatory's work, too. But I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jim. And yeah, these are really important messages and um, about, you know, it's really important to still have information around some of these really difficult challenges around net zero. So information freedom, it's, the suggestion isn't that we did that, that isn't important and that doesn't happen. Also, um, that the, the already existing forms of engagements and important uh, forms of deliberation. I mean, we obviously need more 
of those types of initiatives. And yeah, and I think, as you say, Jim, it's about understanding how this kind of third move, this third uh, perspective can fit with and kind of enhance, um, you know, those other two. And it's brilliant uh, to have you with us today, Jim, because as you said, you um, were, uh, you know, with, well, before the observatory idea was, we even came up with it collectively, um, you were already um, a really important part of uh, the development of, of, of this. And so it's great to get your reflections on the sorts of transformations also that you've been through on over the years in relation to some of the work um, that we're doing. So thank you so much. We're gonna move on now to our third and final panelist, Simon Borrell. And Simon is a senior associate uh, of Involve. And he's also the program director of ScienceWise, the ScienceWise Expert Resource Center. And um, he brings extensive experience in the fields of public participation, stakeholder engagement, accountability and transparency, scientific and te technological innovation and organizational change. Simon is another person who has been working with us for, for a number of years now around these ideas. Um, he's developed these ideas himself around uh, new systemic ways to think about participation. And he has also been involved in the development of, of the observatory um, from an early stage. So again, really pleased to have you here today, Simon. So over to you. Great. Thanks, Jason. Really appreciate being here and really very happy to be here. As you say, I've been involved with you uh, and others in conversations about this idea for, for a, a long time now. And it's so great to kind of see it actually kind of live and, and on the screen and be able to, to explore it. Um, I, I first of all would back up everything that Becky and Jim um, have said, and I'm not going to repeat it. I would that's if I'd gone first, that's what I would have said. So let me try and say something slightly different and maybe put put the observatory in a slightly wider context from a public engagement perspective. Um, Net zero and the energy transition, to my mind, are, are uh, an important class of issue that's emerged for policymakers over the past five or ten years, which are um, often highly technical, uh, very complex, often controversial, and, and will uh, both require and impose on us uh, significant changes to lifestyle. Um, to the way we live, to how we how we view the future, what we think of nature, and so on. So these are really, really important issues that are going to determine what life is like for, for us, our children, and our grandchildren. Um, and they require a very different form of engagement. And you laid out the the kind of trajectory of, of engagement from the deficit approach through to kind of important experiments in in kind of bringing representative samples of the public together into this kind of new wave um, around kind of understanding engagement that's happening already. And all of this is, is really, really important. And it's important to think through why in the context of kind of these types of issues, because none of these issues can be solved by governments alone, by experts alone. They require um, all of us to play our part and to be at the very least um, happy with the changes that are that that the decisions um, that are taken will will impose on us uh, but good engagement will bring forward all sorts of other things as well as as Becky laid out, publics, different publics have all sorts of experience. They may be direct technical expertise of the kind she was laying out, but they also understand their communities very well. They've got um, a very good local knowledge, uh, knowledge about um, community capacities, where the, where the challenges in communities are. They bring um, all sorts of ideas, networks and energy. <clears throat> you only have to look at the number of community led um, uh, energy schemes to identify that there's lots going on without government. And so there's there's resources in terms of both uh, community energy but also in terms of money going into solving some of these problems um, and then critically also as, as Jim highlighted um, questions of trust and be, making sure that at the very least we're bringing people with us uh, even better that we're engaging the public in the sorts of futures that we're creating and imagining. Um, and so no single method can possibly be enough to capture all of that diversity. All of them are important, um, but none of them none of them are going to work by themselves. And I think so if I was kind of do, do, to do the same as Jim did at the end of what I wanted to say, which is to kind of throw out um, a challenge um, to uh, to the observatory and to the public engagement community more generally. I think it's the, the question really is how do we connect all of this back into policymaking? Policymakers often talk about 
um, hard to reach communities. There's never any hard to reach communities. For the policy maker perspective, they're often hard to listen to, which is why they don't reach them because they don't want to hear what they want to say. Um, but actually, from a from a community perspective, it's policy makers who are hard to reach. And so I think it's great. And a resource is a really important and critical element. Um, an online resource is a really critical element of all of this. But how do we connect it back into policy making and provide them with the information in ways they can actually act on it? And I think that that really is the critical critical dimension. Um, some things like the climate assembly are kind of built in by the by the nature of who commissions them. But there's lots of official types of public engagement that don't really plug back into decision making properly. And it's even more the case with these diverse forms of engagement. And I, so I really, really think that's the next stage is how do we construct this manner, this way of listening so that we can actually make sure that as people, uh, some of the questions have been saying, are connected back into decision making. Um, so yeah, so thanks very much. Thanks so much, Simon, for, for your reflections and to for, for contextualizing, um, you know, the challenges here around public engagement more broadly and, you know, doing a comparison between maybe climate change and energy with other, what, with other challenges and issues that we're facing as societies. And um, yeah, and very much um, echoing a lot of uh, the points that uh, Becky and Jim have already made. Um, in terms of responding to all of these uh, great comments from our panelists, I'm now going to hand over to Helen Pallet, uh, the Deputy Lead of the Observatory, and she's going to provide a, um, a few uh, brief comments on, on behalf of the Observatory team, and then we're going to open up to uh, some Q&A. So over to you, Helen. Thanks, Jason, um, and thanks to our speakers. And, and also just to say that Jake Ainsgov has now kind of joined us as a panellist, um, standing in for Becky when she has to nip off so um, Jake can stand in and answer any questions that come up relating to the Climate Assembly um, and the Climate Citizens Project um, that Becky um, talked about. Um, so thanks so much to those three speakers and to Jason for giving us this introduction. We've heard a lot about what people hope for um, from the observatory. Becky hopes that it will enable us to get rid of this phrase that is often used in policy about bringing people with us and this assumption that people aren't already kind of engaged um, with energy and climate change. Um, Jim pointed us towards the new forms of social intelligence that the observatory is going to be able to create, um, which might influence policy and be useful in a range of different contexts. And Simon also talked about how this can help us to draw on public and community knowledge and expertise. Um, there were some challenges, though, that people also raised, um, and as Simon said, these are coming through um, in some of the questions that people have been posting too. Um, so a key one seems to be this thing about, well, this is all well and good, but how do we help to connect these learnings, this listening, um, back into policy? Um, and as Jim said, how can we do that in a way that um, doesn't kind of threaten policymakers or doesn't make them feel kind of threatened and defensive. <clears throat> and I think this links to um, a number of questions that have already been posted um, in the Q&A. So from, from Nigel Hargreaves, his question about this kind of fourth dimension um, of public engagement, which is about kind of how successful are these cases of public engagement at meeting um, a particular policy needs. Um, we've also got um, a question from um, Darren Bhattacharya um, about how, how are we um, experimenting um, in the observatory, how are we trying to um, use this knowledge to help inform decision making and policy development. Um, and a related question uh, from Helen Poulter also. Um, about how can we ensure that um, practitioners listen to um, the outcomes of, of public engagement that we've mapped. So that seems to be um, a very good place to start um, um, our, our discussion. Um, and I'll also keep my eye on the chat um, and on the questions um, to see if any more come up. If you would like to um, talk, you can also raise your hand. Um, but I'll first um, invite our, our panellists to respond to this question about um, what is the observatory doing or what could it do and um, to better connect 
um, back into policy. So Jason, would you like the first response? Sure, Helen, thanks. And thanks to the great questions that are coming through in the chat. Um, it, it's, it's brilliant. And yeah, I mean, this is, this is a massive challenge. And I think, um, you know, other panelists spoke to this really nicely. I think Jim put it really well um, in the sense that this is really challenging. I mean, Jim put it perfectly himself. When you're first faced with one of these maps, these mappings that includes, you know, fr fracking activists on the map as a, a, alongside, I don't know, public opinion surveys, um, focus groups, um, you know, behavior change programs, things that policymakers are more used to when they think about what it, what counts as public engagement, this can be threatening. Um, it can even be kind of ridiculed. I remember when we were showing some of our early mappings to government people in government, go to government departments. Um, you know, some people. I remember asking one question: Are all of these things on on the map that we showed earlier? Are all these forms of engagement equal? And some people started laughing, saying, "Of course they're not." <laughs> You know, some 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 of the things are in on this map are much more important or legitimate than others. Um, which, but in the same, and this links to I think Darren Bhattacharyi's question about you know, do we when we are presenting these maps then um, try and prioritise parts of the map over others? And in a way, these maps then um, do do that kind of work. You start to be challenged. Uh, we all start to be challenged, us as an observatory start to be challenged about what public engagement is, you know, who or what is the public around energy and climate change and what is that issue here? And um, so in a way, that's one of the values of these things. We, we think one of the values of, of, of these mapping approaches, um, but how to interface this into policy? Well, this is the reason why we've got that third strand around experimentation because in a way we don't know all of the answers to this. And so the way that we're approaching this is to work very closely with policymakers, with decision makers uh, in national government, in industry, also in um, community organizations, in civil society. And we just wanna work with these groups, with these organizations um, to explore this together. Um, we don't know what the kind of right answer is in how to do this policy link but it's a really important part of um, the observatory's work and something that, you know, these experiments have started and we're in the middle of them. And we're hoping that we can learn a lot from them and share that with, 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 with others. Thanks, Jason. Do any other of our panelists want to come in on that? Yeah, I can, I can uh, Helen. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think there are a number of different ways, I suppose, that you can engage back into policy. I mean, I've, the experience of developing this idea in the first place was that sometimes you do get champions inside the policy system for this, just public engagement generally and the kind of diverse approach that's been pursued uh, by the observatory. And that's really, really helpful, but quite rare, actually, that you get people who really, really get it. You know, some of the social scientists within, you know, former DEC and then Bayes, you know, were in the probably in that category, but obviously had then had their own internal discussions and battles to have about the legitimacy of all of this, as Jason was saying. Uh, you know, the second is to kind of almost follow their agenda, you know, so when somebody's doing something, it's well, can the observatory bring up evidence about a particular thing, you know, the uh, the, the zombie that is fracking has come back from the dead yet again in the latest conversations. I understand there's a, you know, the BGS report, British Geological Survey report, is going to be published in a few days. Who knows where that leads? Clearly, there's a lot of intelligence about that from protest through to public surveys. So, you know, it's following that agenda. But I think the third, which I think the observatory is doing, as Jason mentioned, is that whole idea of co-developing experiments with decision makers, you know, to get the buy-in. It sounds like a sort of rather old thing to say now, but at one time it was novel, and perhaps for some people it still is novel, that the more you can co-develop something as an experiment, the better chance you're gonna have of having uh, an impact when it comes to results and insights from that from that experiment. So I think that's what's really interesting of what the observatory is now doing. Thanks, Jim. 
Um, so I'm, I'm wary that we've, we've got lots of questions still coming through. So I'd like to um, move the conversation on. Um, and just to point to, so that a question that Richard Milne points, uh, posted while Jason and Jim were talking, I think possibly doesn't need answering because it suggests an answer it, itself. So Richard says, in opening up the diversity of forms of engagement, do we also need to open up the diversity of impact and intention? And just to say thanks, Richard, for raising that point. And that's certainly something that we were hoping for in creating this open access database. So the point really is, this is um, a load of kind of social intelligence or data that can be used, yes, by policymakers, yes, by other academics, but also more widely, you know, we're hopeful that, you know, maybe some community groups or public engagement practitioners or others might also, or activists might also see this as a resource that can be helpful to them and that it might influence their practice. Um, so um, a theme that has been coming through um, in uh, some of the comments is about this idea of a kind of unruly public engagement or the kind of difficult publics that we might um, encounter through public engagement. So I'm thinking particularly of um, questions from Emily Cox and from Dan Thorman, this idea of actually, um, are we overstating the extent to which people are concerned about climate change or the extent to which they, they might be willing to change their lifestyles and kind of deal with all of these kind of vast changes that Simon um, described when he was speaking. Um, and Emily similarly saying, um, you know, is there a limit to um, who we might want to engage? Um, do we as an observatory um, take a line um, in, in, in who we, we want to kind of be promoting or, or putting on our database? I think this might be a good question to go to Simon first, if that's all right, and then I'll invite other panelists. I mean, these are really challenging questions, aren't they? I mean, at, at the kind of extreme of what Emily is saying, we, we know that there are malign actors out there with large amounts of money who are astroturfing some of these issues. Um, and so how do we make judgments about what is authentic uh, engagement uh, from a community level, whatever we, however we define community and at whatever kind of geographic level that might be? Um, and, and what do we think isn't? And how do you make those sorts of decisions? And I think that is a, that is a, a big challenge, I think, um, for... Um, uh, for the observatory, I'm not really sure I've got a, a clear answer to it at, at the moment. I think the um, in answer to um, was it Dan's question about the kind of people aren't interested in um, climate necessarily. I mean, I think that is and that isn't true. Um, we certainly know that you know on a day to day basis, people are much more worried about getting uh, getting the kids to school, visiting granny in the care home, um, and the sorts of kind of deep policy questions um, that are thrown up by this technical policy questions aren't at the top of their mind. Yet at the same stage they are also willing and, in, and able to engage with them if the spaces are created in the right way. Um, and and they may not be engaging in, in ways that are visible to us, but they will be talking about it at home or down the pub, um, as either Becky or Jason was saying at, right at the start. Um, and so it's incumbent on us to be listening to and understanding and engaging with those perspectives where they're happening, uh, because that is where people are, are, are kind of beginning to articulate, develop, think, push for the visions of the future they have, of which climate um, is only one component. Um, there are all sorts of other, other decisions that are being taken, and climate really is only one and a very important um, component, but only one component of the creation of the futures that we're going to be living in. And so not only have we got messy participation within the energy and climate sphere, but we've got, we've got a very, very messy um, public policy arena, and, and it is incumbent on us to, to, listen, to listen to people in these spaces. Um, and to to help create ways in which they can express themselves in ways that make matter and are acted on. Um, and so, Dan, yes, you're right, but you're also wrong. And you're, you're, you're right in the sense that we, we um, people aren't engaging with the climate issue in ways that policymakers are, are kind of expect and are looking for, but they are in ways that they're not. And this is precisely the start of, start of the conversation that the, the observatory is trying to engage with. Thank you, Simon. Um, so I, I suspect Jason might want to come in on this, but I also want to give Jake an opportunity um, to come in, um, perhaps based on any of the work you're doing in the Climate Citizens Project at the minute, if you had any comments on this question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, so what this made me think of is is one of the issues. So, so, so to reiterate what Becky said, one of the things we've been 
the thing we've been doing and working with the observatory on is a citizens panel on, on home energy decarbonisation. Um, and through that process, and anyone who's been involved in these processes will recognise this, we had you know, a particular participant who quite early on chose to be quite disruptive in that process, had very strong views about how appropriate heat pumps were as a, as a form of, as a replacement for gas boilers, and, and basically chose to extract themselves from the process. And that's something you, 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 you regularly encounter with these types of things. But what, what the Observatory's Works helps us do is to place what we're doing in context. And those no longer sort of think of them as a rogue actor or, or you know, think of them as someone who's, who's causing disruption to your process, but think of them as, you know, as, as these comments have come through, someone who is engaging with this, this, this issue, but in a very, very different way. Um, and so, you know, through, through working with the observatory, what we've been able to do is sort of sort of make sure that we don't write those people and those perspectives and those positions out of the way that we present what we're doing, because clearly they are perspectives and issues and, and, and individuals who policymakers themselves are going to have to account for in the way that they create policy in this space. So, um, so yeah, I, th I think that's that's one of the. Well, one of the big things, the value we've got out of this is sort of how, how you think about the form of engagement you're involved in, think about the people who will and won't kind of feel welcome in that space or will or won't contribute in that space and make sure you're cognizant of that in the, in the way that you sort of go through interpreting, um, you know, the, the findings that you get. Yeah, I've not got a, I don't want to say too much, Helen, because I'd much prefer to hear from our panellists, but um, I think I would say that, um, and a lot of this is written up in the materials that you know in the publications that are on the observatory website now and in the briefing note that we mentioned um and there's kind of two aspects to this the kind of guiding principle one of the guiding principles that we use in our mappings um in the methods that we're developing is to attend to diversity to diversity of public engage diversity of publics diversity of forms of participation and engagement and you know the sort of definition that we work with is you know um practices through which um publics engage in collective public problems um, around energy and climate change but you could take other issues and if you go with that definition you can sit there and say well what what wouldn't be included <laughs> what form of participation or engagement wouldn't be included in that definition and so there's really small things that are a part of the mapping like everyday practices in the home like cooking and washing <laughs> and these kinds of things through to some um, larger forms of engagement that may have in, you know, um, forms of investment behind them and may have um, purposes that some people, many people might not agree with. Um, but also on one hand, we attend to diversity, but at the other, on the other hand, I think our mappings show where the powers lie. So if you look across a system of participation or public engagement in the UK around energy transitions, what we found in our earlier work is that there are some forms of engagement that are more prevalent, that are more legitimate, that are more resourced, that, 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 that have more publicity around them than others. Um, and so it reveals these sorts of powers and it can allow us to ask questions about the power, the politics, the political economy that lies behind public engagement as well and the driving forces um so i would like to think that you know that, that we can attend to both of those things thanks jason so um so just to say that we're, we're obviously not going to get to all of the questions that have been asked um tom hargreaves has been beavering away um answering lots of questions um in the q a box um, Robbie Morrison, um, I'm aware you've asked a few very difficult questions of us. Um, I think the one about databases might be one for us to discuss offline. We will check this. I suspect that our definition of a database is slightly different from the legal definition of databases that's being used here, but please send us an email. There's lots of um, information on the website about how um, to get in touch with us. Um, and um, people have already started sending us messages about studies that we might or might not know of and um, that we might want to include um, on in our database too um, and there's a facility for you to do that on the website as well that you will find. Um, I think um, perhaps the best question for us to end with 
is one that Johanna um, posted uh, in the chat. Um, so she says, um, in Edinburgh, they've now got two outreach workers funded by the Scottish Government um, and by the City of Edinburgh Council, um, who aren't talking to each other, but they are meant to be working with communities. So what is it that the panel recommends that these workers start by doing? So obviously the first answer to that question would be to look at our database. <clears throat> That's going to be um, updated over the coming weeks. Um, and in a month or so, there'll be around um, 500 case studies um, to look at and search through on the website. And that number will continue to grow as people like yourselves um, suggest more case studies to us to add. Um, but I'm sure our panel members will have other um, suggestions to make too. So perhaps if I um, allow um, a final word to anybody who would like it. Helen, I could I could just say a quick word, um, maybe to um, also push more um, on from your suggestion of looking maybe at our, our interactive database, open access database. I mean, the other thing that we're doing with the observatory is to is to is to build this network. And I think this comes back to Joanna's point then. I mean, what happens around public engagement is that people get we get siloed around different methods, different kind of philosophies different um, practices, uh, different sectors, disciplinary orientations. So we, we tend to study, you know, deliberation or behavior change or social movements or uh, community action in different ways. And this leads to people, we also judge best practice, so-called, in each of these areas uh, in different ways. And this leads to maybe connections not being made that perhaps should should be, and maybe Johanna's point there um, is a really good one in that in that sense. And so I think one of the things that we're wanting to do is to get people to start to connect up within the observatory's network, and that isn't always going to be easy. There, there's going to be challenge. There's going to be difference. There's going to be debate there. Um, but uh, you know that's that's hopefully um, a good thing, and will allow connections to be made that can be transformative. And um, it can also bring forward a positive change and action too. Fantastic, thanks, Jason. And the, the comments and questions just keep coming in. Um, so um, thanks so much um, to everybody for coming along, for um, contributing to this lively discussion. And it, it sounds like it's gonna be a discussion which continues. So um, please, please do. Uh, we've got a few thank yous to say so um to um to amber sawyer who has been the person behind the scenes making this webinar work to, and to jessica bays and um, both um from uk Energy research center who helps to get everything um, set up today thanks to outlandish who created our website um, and i hope you all agree that it looks brilliant um <clears throat> thanks to our advisory group which involves becky and Simon um, and many other people too, who've given us lots of advice so far about how to um, create this website and database and the broader projects. Um, and thanks also to the observatory team, so particularly Vidya Stefanidis, who's been doing um, a lot of the behind the scenes work to make this all come together, um, and to Tom Hargreaves, and of course to Jason, who is the visionary leader um, of the UK Public Engagement Observatory. So thank you. Helen, I'm just going to leave up this slide, which is how to get in touch and how to contact us if you'd like to, um, and also our Twitter handle there for the observatory. So thanks so much to our panelists today and to also to echo those thanks to everyone that Helen mentioned. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So...